Speaker is Amin Tavakali from the Department of Computer Science, UC Irvine. And he's going to be talking about using graph variational autoencoders for uh, molecular molecules and drug discovery and design. Uh, please take it away. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm um, Amin, and uh, I'm a PhD student at UC Irvine. I'm doing my PhD on their peer book. I'm mainly focusing on um, chemoinformatics, basically deep learning for, for chemistry. And today I'm going to talk about um, continuous representation of molecules using uh, graph variation autoencoders. Um, okay, so um, as a quick introduction, um, um, we, we know that there are numerous ways to, to represent molecules and chemical compounds. Um, we can represent a molecule with images, as you can see here, like, like this image of this graph. You can represent them in a spatial form, like usually it comes in, in the form of uh, 3D coordinates of, of all atoms within a molecule or chemical compound. Um, you can uh, represent them using uh, some, some special language called INCH, International Chemical Identification. It's, it's basically a long chain of a string here as you can see this is this is inch of this is molecule um, and it's it's not easy to write it in a uh, canonical way and it's it's usually being used for com commercial purposes the other way to represent molecules is is my string it's just a string of character it's it's more natural than than inchy because you're, you're seeing the the symbols of, of atoms in that representation and you can see a special character for bonds like equal sign pound sign or you can specify branches using parentheses and and so on um, and it's it's very commonly used representation of, of molecules and, and chemical compounds the other way to represent molecules is uh, fingerprints they are usually uh, in the form of binary fingerprints and as you can see here in, in the form of fingerprint, each element of this fingerprint is, is corresponding to presence of, uh, of a template, or you can call it a functional group that is in us. Um, and the other way to represent molecules, of course, is, is just uh, the graph structure of molecule. As you can see, each molecule is, is a simple graph. So each of these representation has pros and cons. Um, the properties that are important for us as, as uh, machine learning scientists, uh, first of all, the property has to be machine readable uh, in terms of uh, computational purposes. That's, uh, that's obvious. Um, for example, out of these representation images and initial uh, coordinates are, are not very well machine readable. They need some some pre-processing uh, steps to 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 make them ready to be fed into the machine, and they they have to be efficient, of course, because for, for storing purposes, for search through huge databases of of uh, chemical compounds, they have to be efficient. And the, for example, binary fingerprints are not that efficient. In order to avoid collision uh, in the in the huge space of chemical pounds a, a fingerprint has to be super lengthy um, and uh, in order to uniquely represent uh, each molecule so for example both fingerprints are are not that efficient and um, it's it's better to be a continuous representation because if if you're working with continuous representation we can work with optimization and generation tasks uh, of molecules um, here, because the uh, discrete nature of uh, the molecule space, all these representations are, are kind of discrete. So we are looking for a way to, to make it continuous. Um, okay, as I was suggested by one of, by one of the viewers, uh, I'm, I'm going to have a quick introduction on, on graph convolutions and, and then we will dive into our need that we used um, I'm trying to wrap this up as much as possible, but um, we need to talk, we need to go over graph convolution in a few slides. Um, so you can see graph convolution as a function that is eating graphs. It's, it's forming on uh, the, the, the input of, of this function is a graph. Uh, optionally, 
another matrix that is uh, representing the nodes of this graph. So each row of this this optional matrix can be representing the each each node of of the graph basically. Um, so you basically you can input any object that can be represented as a form of graph into this function. Um, doesn't have to be a direct uh, graph. You, you can, you, any object that can be converted into a graph be used as in this function. And um, this, this type of function is, is kind of an old thing. It was started at 2005, uh, this paper by Gory. Um, people, uh, for, for some reason, they, they hadn't touched it enough, but uh, since 2015, I would say it becomes more and more important. And uh, right now, everyone in, in the field of social media modeling, graph, knowledge graph modeling, and uh, natural language processing, anywhere that, that you can work with graph, they are working on solutions. Um, I mean, it's not necessary to, to emphasize on, on the importance of the topic. So um, back to the function of graph convolution, main question is that how can we have a function or a network that uh, can accept a set as, as the input? As, as you know, a graph is, is a set of nodes and it, it's, uh, it can be, the nodes, the order of nodes can be permuted. So, in order to function, it has to be invariant to, to permutation. And the other thing about graphs is they are all uh, coming in, in different structure and devices. So this function has to be able to handle dynamic resizing of, of their input, which, which are graphs. So, and um, so obviously that the first function uh, respects the, the set and is invariant is a mean function. If you have a set of uh, numbers computing the mean is a function that is permutation invariant. Um, going forward, we, we can assume that we are given a set of vectors h1 through hn, all of these numbers, um, or you will understand it automatically. Um, let's say these are a set of vectors that we are. Uh, working with and uh, they come in a form of dimension by d0. d0 is, is the length of each of the vectors. Um, and we can see it as a capital H matrix. In addition to this, we have uh, a graph, graph structure D, which is telling us the, the color structure between these entities, these vectors, these n and in, in our set, it, it usually comes in the form of base density tensor, which is um, telling us how they are connected together. Um, so you, you can use uh, R1 and C1, and then you can construct graph convolution function as follows here. So this function, uh, H0 and G, the graph structure of H0, outputs H1, which is the updated version of H zero. So basically, each row in one is corresponding to one of these these initial objects, and in H one, these rows are updated. It's more information in compared to H zero. Um, how this this op operation is is it's it's uh, written here as follows. Um, so you can see each row of in, in this new matrix as HI1, which is also a uh, small H1. Um, so basically you take the first matrix R1 and you multiply it by the representation of, of node I in the previous uh, matrix, which was H0. And then you add it with, with some other information from the neighbors of, of node I, and you multiply it by C1 matrix. And uh, remember, C1 and R1 are, are constant matrices, all uh, I indices. And then you, you can uh, transform this addition in a nonlinear way to, 
to have your H1 here. And uh, just to mention C, CI here is, is just the, the mean over the neighbors of node I. So basically this, this term is just the information coming from the neighbors of node I, and this term is the information from the node I itself. They are being multiplied by some matrices, we call them convolutional kernel, and then they are being transformed non with a nonlinear function, and here we have our updated uh, representation of nodes. So going forward uh, with this definition of graph convolution, we can construct graph convolution on our networks. Uh, it's, they're just basically a stack of graph convolution functions. Um, again, the, the input to this, uh, this, these networks is uh, initial representation of, of our nodes and uh, the, the connectivity of, of the nodes. Here, well, I'm, I'm fitting a molecule here, which is a graph, obviously. and uh, and as you can see, the representation of each node is, is updated through this scheme here, as I will like. <clears throat> so the other important thing is that at each layer of applying convolution, as in, uh, in this equation, the representation of each is updated with respect to information it's gathering from its immediate names, C here. So if you apply if you apply one layer of graph convolution, there are no, your, your node representation is informed of its immediate neighbor. If you apply it two times, uh, the node representation is gathering information from uh, two hops neighbor and, and so if you have n layer, uh, your, your, each node in your graph is being informed of n nodes away of, of its own. Okay, and um, there are some some points of about implementation. Uh, there are there are two types of implementation we are focusing on here. Um, you can have edge decoration, or you, you you have them. So basically, what what it means is that um, before we were talking about the adjacent matrix, which is a binary matrix. Uh, element one between in, in i j position is is telling us that i is connected to node j, but this connection can has a type. Um, if if you're uh, you're dealing with different types of connection, then you have the correlation edge, um, which was introduced in this paper in two thousand. Of adjacency metrics, you're dealing with adjacent tensor which comes in of n by, by t, and t is, is the number of type of this here. And again, you have initial representation n by d0, d0 n by d0 exactly here. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, gathering information from, from the neighbors can be implemented using uh, adjacency metrics as, as follows here. Uh, you can just simply model by your adjacency tends to, to your node representation matrix and, and this this operation this operation will happen automatically um, so this is applying one layer of GCN with node edge decoration if you have edge type here one layer of GCN be some sort of merging function between these guys and each of them is the one layer of convolution for one edge type. So zero, it started from zero to T, it has to be actually T minus one because we have T types of, of edges. And you somehow with an operation uh, you choose, you, you merge them all into one representation and then you transfer them to with a nonlinear function. Same thing for, for L, of GCN again you merge all these representations you are getting from different edge types and uh, you merge them in a representation and usually this, this merge operation is is summation that people are using and summation here as well so I mean real quick the edge types are different types of bonds or something what, what are those in this example yeah okay so 
I think it's it's enough for uh, graph convolution. So molecular graph is uh, obviously a molecule can be represented in the form of a graph with nodes v and edges e and t uh, number of types of connectivities. So and in the beginning the h zero matrix is just uh, representing um, um, what would be used for representing atoms before applying any graph convolution was just a one hot encoding of atom type and plus some basic properties of atoms like electronegativity and um, valence uh, number and, and some, some basic properties of atoms. Um, in the data set that V, which was randomly taken on Zinc database, uh, we, we processed all models with 10 different atoms. So um, our one hot representation has length of 18. And uh, if, if I'm correct, we, we use six different, um, sorry, use 18 different properties of atoms. Uh, so, so our initial node represent has a length of uh, 36. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I might be wrong, we'll get back to this number later. Um, so the in the node representation and for bond type, for, for connection types, we have four types of connection, which are single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, and aromatic, aromatic bond. And uh, they are represented in a, in a hot uh, encoding length four. Um, the other thing is the, uh, we, we are focusing on a small molecule. We filtered the, the database that we are using with, with this criteria that we are just considering molecules with uh, less than 30 atoms. And uh, one other minor thing that, that might be important is that during implementation, we are we're not using uh, direct matrix A here. Uh, in order to get more statist stable statistical behavior, we, we are normalizing A as follows with, with matrix D, which is just normal matrix with, with these diagonal entries. Okay, so this is the, the graph part of the, of the network that we need to talk about. Um, all these things are, are uh, are represented in, in a value autoencoder framework. So I think everyone here is, is familiar with variational autoencoder. I'm not talking um, too much about this. So, but basically what we are trying to do here is just to approximate the, uh, the posterior distribution of latent variables uh, with some assumptions that they are, uh, the, the L of this latent variable are mutually independent and they are coming from normal distribution. Um, I think that that's enough for, for that just consists of two terms. The, the first is just telling us how good we are in reconstructing the original input and the other one is telling us that how good we are in approximating normal distribution. Um, for, for our latent space distribution. Okay, so going into the main architecture, graph variational autoencoder, um, like, like variational autoencoder, you start with, with an encoder part, but the difference is that the input is not just a vector, it's, it's, a, it's a graph and we are trying to encode the graph. Uh, so the late variable Z is given H and A, which is the initial representation of our matrix and A is just, uh, again, the JCNC tensor. And uh, again, we are assuming they are mutually independent coming from normal distributions. Um, so what we are doing here is, is uh, we are finding mu and covariance metrics for, for these uh, distribution of latent variables. Um, and the, the way that this encoder works is just uh, a graph convolution neural network, one, one, one graph convolution neural network for finding mu and the other graph convolution neural network for finding covariance. Um, just uh, 
as implement details, we use uh, both these GC three layer graph convolution or network for both mu and covariance. And uh, both of them they are sharing their weights in the first two first two GCNs and the third one is, is uh, different for mu and, and sigma. And again, following the law of uh, variational onto encoder, we need to decode this latent variable Z in back in graph. <coughs> um, what we are thinking of is uh, so far we have two options to decode this latent variable back into a graph. The, the first one, which is very simple technique, uh, is, is just uh, an inner product between two variables. So we encode our matrix H in Z, and then we take the elements of Z, Z, I, Z, J, and we do inner products between them. And using a sigmoid function, we decide whether A, I, A, J is one or not. This is the way we are reconstructing the JC tensor. One thing to, to mention here is that using this technique, you're able to reconstruct a JCNC matrix, the binary version of a JCNC matrix. You're able to reconstruct the JCNC tensor, which is represented as well. Um, and this is the, the simplest form of decoder. There is no weight here, it's just simple inner products. So the other way to decode Z back into our graph is again, we take our Z, the, the elements of latent variable Z, I, Z, J, we merge them with, with some operation, and then we pass them through a multi-layer perceptron, and then a softmax layer that with dimension of T. For, for, for our example, this should be a softmax of four, that means this, this representation is, is going to output a vector of length four in the form of softmax, and it tells you which bond type you have between element i and j. Um, this is a more complicated decoder. It has some weight in its MLP. This, this multilayer perceptron and uh, since this is an ongoing research, uh, as far we, we haven't tried this, this second techniques, uh, we were just focusing on the first one, which is just uh, an inner product between latent variables. This technique enables us to reconstruct the adjacency tensor, not only the binary adjacency metrics. And uh, we have one more uh, thing on, on our network, which is site predictor. Um, we, we are using a site prediction on our list for, for two main purposes. One is uh, to better regularize the latent space. Um, for, if it, you can see this as, with, with this example, um, let, let's say you're you are predicting a property, let's say drug likeliness of the points in your latent space. Uh, and you can see this as, as moving, uh, towards a certain direction in the latent space uh, can be interpreted as, as minimizing or maximizing this, this property that you're predicting here. For example, it's, it's drug likeliness. So it, it better regularize the latent space. The other purpose that we use this site predictor is it allows you to optimize molecules with respect to a certain property. Um, again, this is an ongoing research uh, and it's it's not something that we have done so far, but this is something that we are planning to do later. But uh, you can start with uh, with a latent representation of a given molecule, and then you move it or perturb it towards certain direction to, to optimize this representation with some with respect to some property, and then you can decode it back to another molecule. So. By this means, you are generating a new molecule with, with a desired property. Um, so basically, these are the two purposes that we side predictor to our latent space. Uh, and uh, one thing that, that you need to know is that uh, 
In order to predict a property of molecules using our latent space representation, we need to use some pooling mechanism. Uh, remember that uh, the points in latent space are in the form of a mix, and each row is, is representing one network. Since we are going to predict the property of the whole molecule, we need to now convert this matrix into single vector representation of the whole graph. And this mechanism called graph pooling. And this is the pooling mechanism that, that we use. It was introduced by David Duvanad in 2015. I forgot to cite his paper here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but basically, we, we have WP weights of pooling which is basically changing the length of representation of each node and then pass it through a soft and then you have element-wise addition for all the nodes. By means you have a new vector representation for your whole graph and then and then we can uh, feed this this whole representation GHL to our site predictor, which is an MLP, and then we can predict the, the site target. So basically, this is the overall structure of the network. We have uh, one GCN for mu, one GCN for sigma. We have this latent space, and then we, we perform pooling on this latent space, predict the site target, and then we, using decoder, we are reconnecting back the, the adjacency tensor. Okay, some something about some details about training our uh, graph DE is that uh, training it, training two models joint, the side predictor and uh, the graph VAE with just adding this term, this last term of the side prediction to our overall law. <clears throat> and uh, for this predictor, we are using an MLP of one layer MLP of uh, size that has 64 by one weight matrix. Uh, that means the final representation of the molecule is length 64. Three layers of GCN uh, for mu and sigma, they are sharing the first two gen. Each of these shared GCNs has the kernel 32 by 32. Um, that means that our chill node representation is uh, of length 32. Sorry, I was mistaken. I told you it was 63. It was six, it was, I told you it was 36, but it was uh, 32. And the third GCN uh, has the kernel size of 3016. That means that the, the representation of each node in the latent space is of length 16. And the pooling weight, pooling mechanism is 60 by 64, which means that the representation of the molecule is of length six, uh, before uh, the side prediction. <clears throat> and uh, all the molecules that we are train we are using as training set are padded with dummy nodes up to 30 nodes. So all the graphs that we are processing has, they, they all have 30 nodes. And um, we perform match uh, gradient descent with uh, repartization of the VA. And again, the first type of decoder was, was employed. We are working on employing the second type of decoder, uh, but we, have, we, we don't have uh, any results on that so far. Okay, um, there was a technique. Of basically, this is very, very similar to what we used here, uh, but this way by Gomez and Rafael, they, they are. Uh, focusing on a small representation of fields. Um, basically, they, basically, they have additional autoencoder with a side predictor, but the input and output is the smallest. Um, and one thing that the other also mentioned that uh, there are some downside with the smile represent. They are not uh, as informative as graph structure representation is. This is the first downside. And the other is that uh, the SMISE representation is, is very sensitive. You, by just missing one character or replacing one character with another one, you will end up with, with an invalid chemical structure, which is, uh, which is another downside of a SMISE string. Um, 
that the others mention in this work, but the the the, the advantage of smile the string this framework is uh, your latent space has the form of a vector. I mean, every point in space is vector, not a matrix. Um, so, if when you have this this vector, you can easily reconstruct your original input without any pooling mechanism or, or some 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 something else uh, and that helps you with generation of new molecule and optimization of new molecules i will get back uh, to this one later but this one i mean representing all in graphs is a huge limit for us to to do molecule optimization okay uh, Two simple exam two simple experiment that that we have performed uh, for this work is just first one is just the similarity measure between um, molecules. Uh, it's it's very uh, simple experiment. I mean, it was not the goal of this this research, but it was something to to test the the, the method. Um, so we, we take aspirin as as a molecule, and we. We, we compared the, the similarity measure of this well-known similarity metrics with, with our technique and also the SMILES VAE that was that I was just uh, talking about. So these are four other drugs that we are going to compare them with with aspirin in terms of similarity of the molecule. If you look at this, the first similarity measure, which is a very well-known metric, this does Nicotine is the most similar drug to, to aspirin. If you look at our technique here, uh, you, you can see the same thing. Uh, nicotine is, is the most similar drug to, to aspirin here. And then the second most similar is caffeine here. All these methods are, are saying caffeine is, is the second similar drug as well as our technique here. But, but here, if, if you look at SMILES VAE, it is predicting caffeine as the most similar drug to aspirin, which is, which is not very well aligned with, with all these well-known similarity curves. Um, but, but looking at these numbers, you can find that the numbers from graph VAE is that they are very well with, with other similarity measures. The other experiment, which was uh, property per um, Again, it's it's very simple experiment. We can do this with without any variational autoencoder. We could just do it with with uh, graph networks and pooling mechanism. Um, but here, just just uh, as another proof that this technique is working very well, we take a thousand randomly selected molecules from zinc data set, and we predict these three properties of drug cleanliness. Um, score of synthetic synthetic scores and solubility of of the molecule, and these are <clears throat> the 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 of our prediction. Uh, since since this these all three are regression tasks, we we consider an interval for the for the prediction, which is mentioned in the the original paper. I'm I'm not sure what was the the length of interval, but these are in the form of percentage. As you can see, using solubility as a side predictor and helps us better predict the solubility of, of unseen molecules. Same thing for synthetic score and same thing for drug likeliness. Um, and again, if, if you compare these numbers with, with other benchmark of these property predictions, you can find that these are very high numbers in, in prediction of these properties. <clears throat> okay, just, just to wrap up, uh, there are some ideas for, for future work. Uh, we are working on some invertible pooling mechanism. This allows us to start from a property and we, we directly start from a maximum value of a property. We go back to the latent space and then we, we dig back graph. 
uh, but here as our uh, pooling mechanism is not invertible we cannot do it right now we can use attention graph neural networks instead of graph convolution there are numerous papers that are showing that attention graph networks are, are doing better than normal graph convolutions and uh, of course we can use more complicated structures for for decoding latent variable into graph just to conclude what uh, i've been talking about it's just a new method to represent molecule in a, in a continuous way and differential way we are taking advantage of graph structure instead of smize string text which are less informative than, than graph structures um, the main limit of this technique is that uh, the latent space is is a node-wise representation of the molecule um, and it doesn't allow us to do molecular optimization and generation right now um, and uh, instead of a simple decoder if, if you if you use multi-head decoder which are reconstructing a JSS in tensor and the original feature representation matrix H we will be able to generate molecule and optimize molecule again. Uh, this is another way to, to move forward in this um, research. Um, I think this is the last slide and I think um, I used more than 30 minutes. So I would be happy to take any question if there are any. Thank you. I mean, do we, we have a couple of time for maybe one, two really quick questions. Okay. So the reason it can't do the molecular optimization and generation is because of the, it doesn't have the bond, the, the labeling of the bonds yet? I've missed. Um, so the, the main thing is that if, if you want to decode a point in the latent space back into a, a molecule, you need to reconstruct that JCC tensor and also the feature uh, representation of the, the molecule that is telling you which, which atoms are, are in that molecule. So right now we are just reconstructing adjacency tensor, so we cannot generate meaningful uh, molecules. Okay. Any other questions? If not, uh, thank you, Amin, and we'll go ahead and uh, move on.